Hello, everyone. I'll welcome back to the last class of um, computer networks and artificial intelligence class. So this last class is about routing security. So let me briefly um, recap what we have covered in routing section. All right. So first, I walked you through how routing works, how intra and interdomain routing protocol works, and the how BGP works, and what kinds of security problems exist in BGP protocols. And lastly, I walked you, I walked you through uh, the new security uh, routing security protocol, which is called uh, RPKI that solves the major, uh, the major challenges of routing security protocol. I'm sorry, major security challenge of routing protocol. So I uh, also uh, uh, showed you uh, some examples of routing attacks such as BGP or BGP cell prefix hijacking and also um, uh, AS prepending attack, yeah? So let me briefly recap how in a very high level point, how RPKI works. So public key infrastructure, RPKI is a public key infrastructure framework designed to secure internet routing structures, especially for BGP. So in a high level, it helps router to construct the kind of verifiable mapping database so that it can filter BGP announcement, which is, is turn, that is turned out to be invalid, right? So to use that, uh, Virginia Tech, for example, Virginia Tech, it has also its AS number and the IP prefixes that managed by Virginia Tech. So assuming that Virginia Tech has created uh, RPKI objects to and unloaded to its uh, RIR repository to assert, to certify that they are the actual owner of IP prefix. And after that, Virginia Tech will announce the IP prefixes and also appending this AS number 4385 as this routing BGP announcement uh, propagated over the globe, and once the routers ASs receive this route announcement, they also propagated forwarded back to the neighbor by appending its AS number uh, in front of the origin. So in this case, as you can tell, there are two AS numbers appended after the origin, which means the original BGP announcement originated from Virginia Tech actually passed it to the AS number 3356 routers. And also this AS also forwarded this announcement to the AS1299, which eventually arrived this router. So uh, when this router received this BGP announcement, it can take a look what, kind, what AS numbers are in this AS path so that it can learn, oh, if I pass this, uh, uh, one packet to this IP address to AS1299, then you can tell, oh, it will be eventually forwarded to the origin, 4385, okay? So sometimes it is called breadcrumb protocol because if you uh, have read the uh, Hensel and Gretel, right? So the Hen Hensel and the Gretel uses the breadcrumb to uh, mark the path they have been, you know, uh, followed through so that they can pick the brand Chrome again, reversely to follow the destination, right? So uh, routers, once it received this BGP announcement, it checks whether the prefix and the origin pair is in the database. So as you can tell, it's in the database and the IP prefix origin is also 4385 in the database so that it can accept uh, this BGP announcement. So in, from the perspective of router, there are certain validation process. So if there is an entry, which is called VRP, that covers the IP prefix, then it follows to the next step. But if there is no entry covered by VRP, so just for your recall, this each entry is called validated, uh, uh, validated payload object, VRP, routing pay payload. Let me see. A uh, validator ROA, uh, ROA object, so VRP. Um, so it first tries to, when it uh, when the router received the BGP announcement, it first tried to check if this IP prefix is in the database or not. If it is not, then it, it comes to a kind of soft failure mode 
So it just assumed that, all right, I cannot decide anything else, you know, based on this information because basically I cannot find the IP prefix. So it's just accepted. And if the VRP ASN and the BGP are identical, then um, it, uh, it, can, it, it can be a you know, more specific IP prefixes. So it has to be rejected. But if it is actually matched with the AS number and the max length, then it will be accepted. If those numbers are different, then of course it will be rejected. And the second criteria is again, if the AS numbers are different, it has to be also rejected, All right? So the first, so there are uh, two questions. The first one is how many network operators, resource owners that have you know, many, many IP prefixes, how many of them actually generated this RPKI objects, ROA and VRP objects, and uploaded to the central you know, repositories, which means they try to protect their own resources. The other perspective is how many of them, how many routers, network operators actually do validation using RPKI? So in this class, we're gonna focus on these two perspectives, uh, both perspectives, but let me show you how we can focus on and how we can uh, the analyze the deployment uh, for the, you know, by focusing on the first perspective. So the answer is really, you know, the methodology is very straightforward because as you recall, network owners has to create a certificate and row out objects. And after that, it has to upload it, this, this objects to regional internet registries repository. So by fetching all these repositories, all the objects in the repository, because repositories are publicly available, you can just dump all the objects from each repository. So that's what we did. So we uh, dumped all the objects from 2011 to 2019 so that we can uh, understand the kind of bigger picture, how RPKI has been deployed by the research owner uh, by publishing ROA, okay? So this is a quick example of, you know, focusing on the deployment. X axis is a date and Y axis is a percentage of IPv4 or percentage of ASs or percentage of these VRPs, ROA objects, uh, you know, the, the, the deployed RPKI. So the good news is, as you can tell, it is a general increasing trend in adoption of RPKI, which is good. But of course, depending on area, there are slightly differences in terms of the deployment rate. Uh, for example, if you focus on the green graph, it is ripe NCC European region. Uh, because we are, that is very similar to what we observed in the NSF class. So there are, you know, typically the European countries that have, has a strong motivation, strong uh, kind of initiative to deploy some security protocols like Dane or DNSSEC and also RPKI. So in case of right NCC, you can see about 20%, nearly 20% of the IP prefixes on the ASs, uh, they are covered, verifiable using RPKI, which is good. But if you're focusing on the ARIN or AFRINIC, you know, the deployment rate is really, really small. So in case of AFRINIC, it is less than 1%, which is bad, right? Um, now we uh, have the RPKI objects, which is a kind of ground, ground truth data set. And what we can do is the question would be how many BGP announcements out there? Right? Currently there are many, many BGP announcements right, in the network. And how many of them can be verifiable using RPKI? And how many of them can be verifiable or actually valid, right? So what we did was we collect all the PGP announcements from public you know, collectors like Wright Reese and Rob Hughes. And also we collaborated with one of the largest CDN company, Akamai, to collect as many you know, as PGP announcements. So this is the uh, uh, PGP announcements and the percentage that are covered by RPKI. And the good news is also increasing. But a slightly you know, bad news is only 20% of you know, BGP announcements can be verifiable using RPKI. But we believe you know, the last snapshot is 2019. So I believe in 2020, the coverage is much you know, greater than that. Um, and also uh, we can validate this BGP announcement. So we validate them right, using RPKI objects. We found that about 10% of them are actually invalid, which means you know, it is really bad, right? 
Um, so this involved PGP announcement presentation, uh, the good news is it is dropping. Um, at the first stage, a couple of years, after, right after RPKI was introduced, as you can tell from this graph, about 40% or 6% of the RPK uh, PGP announcements are actually invalid. It was a, such a mayhem, right? Because we believe at the time, they do not, the even network operators, they do not know how to deploy RPKI correctly. But as time goes by, uh, the, this, uh, the RPKI invalid percentage dropped to nearly 1%, which is good, yeah. Um, yeah. So there are many reasons why this BGP announcement is invalid. So, uh, of course, you might, uh, of course, the not all BGP, invalid BGP announcements are hijacking of that. It could be some misconfiguration or it could be a yes, kind of mistake, right? So what I'm saying is, it doesn't always necessarily mean that the invalid BGP announcement, invalid RPKI, invalid you know, BGP announcements are actually hijacking of that, okay? So, for example, if the IP prefixes announced by, let's say, BGP, uh, this IP prefixes announced by one AS, and let's say this AS number does not match the, with the RPKI, which was wrong ASN, right? And it could be some potential reasons. So, for example, it could be a hijacking attack, right? But also, it could be some ASs that maintain lots of ASs, like Comcast, you know, single ASN, I'm sorry, single ISP. They have multiple AS numbers. So sometimes they switch IP prefixes from one to another, but sometimes they forgot to update the uh, RPKI entries. So in that case, even if the AS numbers are different, right? But actually these two ASNs are managed by the same company, so it is really rare that this case would be hijacking attempts, right? It could be such a just misconfiguration. If the IP prefix is too specific, right? It means it is announced by the same operator, same ASN, but simply the announced BGP announcement, uh, announced, you know, BGP announcements uh, IP prefixes is more specific than the IP prefixes registered in ROA, right? So that means it could be a kind of misconfiguration of the network operators, or they just simply forgot to update their ROA. Yeah. Um, so we did a, a kind of you know measurement to study how many of them are too specific or how many of them are wrong ASN. And the quick answer is, yeah, there are many cases, right? So um, let me skip it. Even for the wrong ASN, there are some, you know, it could be a same ISP that manages a huge, you know, same ISP that manages multiple AS numbers, or it could be a provider customer relationship. Sometimes providers list some IP prefixes uh, to customers. In that case, customer has no ability to update the ROA object. So in that case, provider, they should have, been, they should have had a updated uh, the AS number to customer uh, AS number, but sometimes providers forgot it. So that's what happens when the mismatch comes, right? Uh, sometimes DDoS protection ASs, such as, you know, uh, some large ASs uh, like uh, Cloudflare, they provide DDoS protection services for other ASs. So what they do is <laughs> this DDoS protection company, they first accept all the traffic they were originally supposed to head into the the, or, uh, the customers, you know, their customers, right, origin, but they first take the, all the traffic and after that, they, they decide whether this traffic is benign or not. Uh, if it is benign, then they forward this traffic back to the original destination. So it is like a kind of firewall, right? So to receive all the traffic on behalf of the origin, they have to first announce these IP prefixes from their AS numbers to receive all the traffic. But if you're doing so, the origin, you know, the original IP prefix owner, they have to update their ROA, they have to update their ROA AS number to this uh, provider, DDoS protection company is right? If they just forgot it, then of course the AS number mismatch happens. So yeah, that is the case. Um, so we find that there are many cases that uh, 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 they apply to the same ISP or a provider customer in the DDoS protection companies. And the other cases that we cannot identify, for example, 
Uh, the IP prefixes are announced by known owner uh, uh, AS number, but uh, this AS number is nothing to do with the origin AS. Then it should be probably, right, the hijacker. So what we can do is we can, um, there is a kind of another uh, platform called BGP stream that collect all the BGP incident report and to categorize them as a, whether it is the uh, kind of hijacking attempt or not. So what we did was we collect this BGP announcement and to find that about 94% of them are in that unknown category. So if this PGP announcement, invalid PGP announcement is not from the same company or is not from the provider customer relationship or is not from the DDoS, then it is highly likely that, that the announcement is actually hijacking attack. You know? So the quick conclusion is, um, yeah, um, RPKI has been widely deployed, and of course there are some you know differences based on the RIRs, and the two percent of them are invalid. Uh, it could, but uh, the, the majority re the majority of the reasons why they are invalid is because of the misconfiguration, right? So now let's move on. So so far, you know, in the first section of this RPKI, we covered on the deployment side, right? How many network owners, resource owners? publish this RPKI objects to the RIRs. So we download this object and it showed that how many of them are supporting RPKI. Now let's focus on the other perspective, which is how many routers actually does this validation using RPKI? But the thing is, answering this question is really, 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 really hard because our PKI, uh, uh, when you would like to focus on the, uh, uh, the verifier side, right? such as in, in case of the RPKI, you have to have an access to the routers because it is the router that actually perform validation, but we do not have any control to the router, okay? So let's say you're in LG Telecom, you want to verify if the LG Telecom's routers do the RPKI validation or not, and how can you do it, right? It is really hard, right? So there are some approaches, previous approaches that try to answer this question, okay? So there is a one website you can go to, uh, you can test your web, uh, ISP, which is called Is BGP Safe Yet? Their mechanism, it, this website is run by Cloudflare, large hosting providers. And their methodology is really straightforward. So what they do is, because they manage a, a chunk of, you know, IPv, big IPv4 spaces. So what they do is they allocate two IP prefixes and they register the ROA both, right? But one is they register the ROA, you know, valid RP ROA object, which is matched with, you know, the, the AS number in the ROA is matched with the actual AS number that announced it by Cloudflare. So which is this IP prefix is valid, right? The other one is they also register this ROA object, but intentionally, they first they mentioned this uh, AS number, which has nothing to do with Cloudflare. So to make it intentionally uh, invalid. So ASD of Cloudflare, they also announced these two IP prefixes at the same time, but the announcement, the BGP announcement that is covered by this invalid ROA will be invalidated. So uh, AS on uh, the ISPs or you know, ASs that perform validation using RPKI they will not able to connect, you know, the communicate with these IP prefixes, okay? So if you click this test your ISP button, they internally, what they do is they try to fetch the two contents from valid RPKI IP prefixes and invalid one. So if it turns out that your ISP, your computer can download both contents, it means your ISP probably don't do any validation because uh, the reason why you can get the content from the invalid, I guess, invalid IP prefixes is because there is a root, right? The routers must have uh, accepted the BGP announcement coming from the, you know, the, that is uh, not matched with the RPKI objects, right? But on the other hand, if your, compu if your computer can receive, the, you know, only, only receive the valid announcement, it means your ISP probably filtered this invalid IP prefixes. So they have no root to that IP prefixes. So that was the reason why you only can fetch the, uh, could uh, fetch the uh, valid one. So 
this test is yeah, popular, but the thing is, it is not scalable, okay? So if you'd like to test, you know, there are more than 60,000 ASCs out there. So if you want to figure out know, how many of them are actually doing you know, RPK validation, you have to find volunteers from the 60,000 ASCs, so which is not scalable. And sometimes <laughs> it is not accurate. And also uh, like you individuals, it is really hard to such you know to perform this uh, experiment because you have to own IP prefixes, and this stage IP before space is already depleted, so it is really expensive. Okay. Another approach is cross-source based spreadsheet uh, managed by network operators. So if you go there, the network operators can specify their RPK policy in the uh, in the on the spreadsheet. But as you can tell, it is not scalable and also it is really how can you verify this reader so are you going to just trust them right it's hard another one is we can just rely on the blog post or official blog post or official twitter account or mailing this uh, among the network operators but it also does scale <laughs> so what i'm going to show you is i'd like to uh, present another you know side channel technique uh, that we can use a uh, to measure um, our validation status. So to understand this concept, you have to also under, you have to know the kind of uh, three different techniques uh, to um, yeah as a kind of preliminaries. All right. So first one is a TCP three way handshake, and also another one is IPID, and another one is IP source spoofing. So so let me start from there. Um, so I believe most of you should be enough familiar with uh, TCP handshake, but if you're not, it's fine. Let me walk you through. Um, so TCP three hand way shake uh, uh, happens like this. Uh, the sender must send a SYN packet and receiver reply back to the SYN ACK packet. And after that, ACK packet comes after, you know, uh, after the ACK packet. So this, this is the reason why it is called three-way handshake. So before uh, completing a, a channel, it has to uh, uh, exchange three different packets to finally establish a, a channel, okay? So another interesting perspective of this TCP handshake is because TCP guarantees the delivery, packet delivery. So if the packet does not deliver, and if, uh, if the packet is received, then the receiver has to reply back to the kind of act packet, right? Act packet means, hey, I received your packet, okay? So if this act packet does not come, right? So receiver in that case, receiver reply back to the same act packet and receiver, because the receiver just sent one packet, it is expecting to another packet will be received, will be sent from the sender, okay? But let's say that the receiver does not receive the uh, act packet yet after sending the second packet, right? Sync plus act packet. But in that case, there is a retransmission timeout. The receiver assumed that, oh, my packet must have uh, been lost in the middle. So after typically it is three seconds, it weighs three seconds to receive the act packet from the sender, right? and the packet does not come, then you will just retransmit the packet, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the, another one is um, called uh, the unsolicited uh, seen as a TCP handshake. So in that case, the receiver just receive uh, uh, receiver just to send a sin plus act packet. Sin plus act packet usually is sent after receiving the sin packet, right? But in that case, sender never tries to initiate the communication. Sender never sent any sin packet, but receiver just simply responded with the sin act packet, right? In that case, sender may send reset packet saying that, hey, I never sent this packet, so please terminate the, you know, this connection immediately. So let's focus on the second part. IPID is the uh, IP packet identifier. 
So it was originally designed to assist the packet fragmentation and reassembly by assigning a unique identifier to each packet. So each packet, if one packet is too big to be handled by one router, the router can split one packet into two, you know, two different packets. But uh, from the another receiver side, they have to combine this packet together to interpret this packet correctly. But to combine this packet, there has to be a kind of, you know, kind of a hint to combine these two different packets into one. So in that case, they share the same identifier, right? So router that split it, this one packet to you know, two different packets, they copy the one identifier and they share it to another you know, packet. So from the receiver's perspective, they can combine two packets easily if they share the same identifier. Then the question is how to assign this IP ID. So there are numerous techniques to ident uh, assign IP identifier. But one very old technique is to assign a, a unique IP ID by incrementing by one whenever the host sends a new packet, regardless of the destination. Right? So using these two concepts, we can tell, we can actually measure the connectivity of the two remote end hosts. So research question here is, from the observer's perspective, you would like to know if B can send a packet to A. So observer does not have any control A and B, but using this IPID technique and the TCP handshake, the observer wants to know if they have some connectivity. So we are using IPID side channel, okay? So let me tell you how it works. Um, first, uh, we assume that we, we're going to name it differently. So reflector, they would like to uh, reflector uh, the, so we're going to name it B to a uh, reflector and A to the target, okay? So let's say if the reflector has no background traffic and measurement the client with, from our observer's perspective, right? We send a SIM packet to the reflector and the SIM act packet comes, right? But the thing is, we never uh, complete the TL TCP handshake. We just want to receive the CMAC packet. We want to receive a packet from the reflector. Because we receive it on a packet, we can extract the identifier, IP identifier, and recur this value, right? So let's say it is one. And after that, we send a spoofed scene packet to the target. The so what spoofed scene packet means when we are sending a packet to the target, we intentionally modify the source IP address field to the reflector's IP address, right? Not our IP address, right? To reflector's IP address. In that case, target will reply because target would think that, oh, this packet comes from the reflector because the source IP address is the reflector's IP address, right? So target will reply back to the reflector, say that with the CNF packet. So in that case, Reflector will reply back to the target saying that, hey, I never initiated this communication, so please reset it. Terminate it by sending reset packet. And we send another SIN packet at the same time, and we also receive the egg packet and we can record the IPID value. In that case, Reflector always sent the packet to the target, so they must have incremented the IPID value. So the next IPID value will be incremented by two. So that is the reason why I did three. And we keep sending it into four. So the concept is we constantly measure the IPID value by keep sending the SIM packet to the reflector from our measurement client. And at the same time, we send many spoofed packets to the target to recur the IPID changes uh, from the reflector. So there can be three different scenarios. The first one is if there is no filtering, right? So reflector can send the packet to the target, no filtering. Or there can be some inbound filtering, such as target cannot send the packet to the reflector. The other one is outbound filtering. Reflector uh, can, can send a packet to the target, but for some reason, it is filtered by reflector's network. So uh, we can um, distinguish the three cases. So for example, 
for the, um, and now we are sending 10 spoof to packet, as you can tell here, a massive number of sim, spoof to sim packet. So when there is no filtering, then because we sent a 10 spoof to packet, the reflector will also respond to the target with the 10 reset packet. So if we are keep measuring the IPID growth, we will know there is a one spike, right? Measure in the middle. And if there is an inbound filtering, this CNF packet will never reach the reflector. So the IPID growth will be rate, you know, just the one, right? The same. And if it is the uh, outbound filtering, then this reset packet will be, uh, you know, causing a spike because reflector sent 10 reset packet, which is very similar to the first case. But this case is a slightly different because target was expecting to receive the act packet, but the reset packet or act packet never come, right? So after the retransmission timeout, typically three seconds, the target will send additional 10 spoof to packet, right? 10 additional CNAC packet and reflector will also regenerate it, can reset packet, which causes another time, another, I'm sorry, re, another spike. So in this way, by focusing on the last session, we can actually measure RPKI, ROV, route, route origin validation, filtering uh, scenario. So it could be a little bit uh, tricky, but uh, please spare me with a few minutes, okay? So when we choose a target, we intentionally find a host where this IP address is covered by RPKI, but an invalid, okay? So this target's ASs, all the, a, this BGP announcement is invalid, okay? So if this reflector ASCs perform validation, then there must have no path to, from the reflector ASCs to the target's AS. Because the BGP announcement coming from the target must have been filtered by this reflector's AS. Does it make sense? Right? So if a reflector cannot send the packet to the target, it may indicate that the target, the uh, reflector AS performs routing origin validation, okay? So of course, uh, if we only focus on one reflector in the AS and the may field, uh, if the host cannot send the packet to the target, then it could be uh, due to uh, some client issues like the intermittent network issues or you know, the other uh, perspective. But if we can find 10 reflector in the same AS and all of these 10 reflectors cannot send the packet to the target, then it could indicate that this AS perform validation. So, and also if we find this 10 reflector cannot send any packet to 20 targets that serve the invalid IP prefixes, then it cause it introduces another guarantee that this target, uh, this reflector's AS must perform validation. Okay, so it is just the, you know, uh, based on the, all the numbers, all right? So we can just run, we can run this experiment, uh, you know, through a year. And uh, of course, the next question is whether we can, you know, uh, uh, confirm our uh, methodology is correct or not, all right? So we can do some cross validation with other well known sources. So as I mentioned before, there are some uh, the network operators that uses a blog post or a Twitter account to uh, announce their RPKI validation policy. So what we did was we scraped it and we compare with our uh, research, right? And we only find there are four mismatches and the three of them are identified that our research are correct. And <laughs> yeah, so which means this methodology works, right? Um, and we also, during our measurement period, one ASS analysis is ROB, you know, validation policy on March 16th. And from our users, we found that they actually did so on March 14, which means they, before making, you know, official announcement, they tested at least for two days to make sure that their, their uh, ROB works correctly, okay? 
<laughs> we can skip it. Um, and uh, uh, more popular ASUs that manages many, you know, bigger, uh, big IP addresses, they tend to perform out of way. All right. Oops, sorry. Um, so the quick conclusion is, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, quick summary is uh, routing is um, so in this way we can measure whether these routers perform validation or not. So routing is the reason why it was really difficult. So compare it with the uh, DNS experiment, right? So if we want to test a, a DNS resolver, we can use Luminati or other you know, proxy services, or if we want to test the public resolvers, we can use them, right? But in case of a router, we cannot test in, in any, you know, any routers over the globe. So what we decided was using a side channel, okay? So um, it is really important to understand, characterize who does this kind of validation, because if we have no idea, and if it turns out that no one does the validation, it will eventually create a attack surface, right? Attack surface. But the challenge was, it was really hard to measure this out of way policy over the network global or network operators. So we did, you know, we invented a methodology. So, so wrap it up. Uh, there are, um, so if you'd like to understand, if you'd like to draw a, a bigger picture of routing security, you first try to, you first need to understand how routing works, right? How BGP works. What is the challenges of our routing? Basically, there is no authorization you know, mechanism, right? To solve that, RPKI was proposed and all PKI protocol works correctly only when all principles involved in the protocol work correctly, which means network operator have to publish the RPKI objects correctly. And also validators, each router has to use this RPKI information to validate the BGP on OSMO. Right, so I just do, you know uh, showed you a uh, two research you know, two piece of research work that focus on each perspective. All right, so you have to so when you draw the big picture to understand the whole problem of the uh, the routing, you have to understand routing uh, what how routing works using BGP. What is the security challenge? What is how RPKI works and how we can measure these two different perspectives. All right, <laughs> cool. Um, all right. So thank you so much. So uh, if you have, you know, again, any question uh, about all the you know, PKI protocols that we covered throughout the class, please feel free to shoot me an email. Okay, I'll be happy to you know answer your questions. And yeah, the slides is already you know slide deck is already available. So please take a quick moment to recap all the you know slides. Uh, all right, I hope you enjoy this class and thank you so much. And yeah, hope to see you soon. All right, bye.